Okay, folks, I think we'll get started. I'm Larry Fennison. It's a real privilege for me to share the stage and the mic with uh, Dick Ring. And, uh, you know, Larry and I, we were a little bit concerned here when we, we get here pretty early and the, the place was empty and we said, no. <laughs> Somebody said there was going to be a full house, but uh, we thank you people for making the trek over here, and a lot of them came over by bicycle, which was absolutely amazing. Hope you enjoyed your ride over. Yeah. The way we're going to work this out is uh, I'm going to say a few things about my books and use that as a way to introduce <coughs> Dick in some, some ways that uh, may surprise you. Let's put it that way. So thanks to Peter Mooney and uh, WheelWorks staff like Deborah uh, Bernard, uh, Ed Sassler, and John Courier for helping out, and all the rest of the uh, staff here who's helped to make this happen. Also to John Allen, who's filming today. He's a league and cycling savvy instructor. And uh, to Melanie Morris, who has her own cycling group. Yes, and hosts yes. a TV show on Somerville Cable TV called The Lady in the Yellow Jacket. It uh, is on Mondays at 7.30 on Somerville Cable TV. They're filming the event for the Bicycling History Archive at UMass Boston and for wider distribution. And finally, thanks to wheel workers Scott Chamberlain and... Uh, Michael, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Warren Kobler, who have helped me with mountain biking research, and to Scott for putting in shape a Raleigh Record Ace racing bike circa 1933. The bike belonged to Dr. Edgar Apt, a dentist who created the Federated Cycle Clubs of New England and began to bring amateur racing back. We hope to hang the bike in the Bicycling Archives at UMass Boston. I want to recognize also Jan Brown, Major Taylor's great-granddaughter, one of the founding members and ex-board member of Cycling Through History, who is here with us today, and she's, she's also a friend of the uh, Bicycle History Archive. And thanks also to the uh, descendants of a number of people. Al Crossley, who was a famous six-day rider, in the 1920s and 1930s. Also to Alan Cote for his contribution of pictures from his father Joe's scrapbooks, and to Dean Bolt, a senior racer out of Hartford, Connecticut, and son of Francis Palmer, a famous girl racer in the 1930s. To the families of Buddy, Hall, uh, Buddy Dodd and Bob Hall, Dick's racing buddies in the 1950s. They all donated some great scrapbooks and pictures, and I've taken from them for this afternoon's presentation. So, Peter asked me to talk about my books, Boston Cycling Craze, which was published in, uh, by UMass Press in 2014. Autographed copies are available at a special price upstairs as a special gift item for the cyclist in your family. My new book is uh, Boston's 20th Century Cycling Renaissance. And this is one of the pictures from the book, Bike Day 1979. A ride from Boston Common to Memorial Drive Bike Fair. And you'll see the big sign there carrying along, Celebrate the Bike. So it was great fun to work on that. Hopefully it'll be out in August or September of 2018. There are sections of this book on the history of road, cyclocross, mountain and BMX racing, recreational riding, commuting, charity rides, messengering, bicycling for social purpose like bikes not bombs. I'll talk about them today, but my real task this afternoon is to be setup man for the main event, which is Dick Ray. And we can start with this picture uh, I'm not going to ask him to talk about this yet. Uh, this is a picture taken on uh, Soldier's Field Road, the track that existed there for quite a number of years. This picture taken, was taken in about 1948 or thereabouts. And the mystery of this, you see the horse. Joe Cody's behind the horse, 
and uh, Dick is pulling in last place, <laughs> perhaps because he's wearing, as you can say, see street clothes, and I'll ask him to explain that a little bit later. Uh, that's kind of a mystery, and uh, so we'll, we'll talk about it later. And, but here's a clue. If you take a close look at that, you'll see it's Dick just sitting on a bike. But what has he got on his feet? He's got his ice skates on. So Dick is tangled up with my writing about the history of bicycling in more ways than you can imagine. I first interviewed him a few years ago and heard a lot about his start in bicycling after having forged a competitive record as a teenage speed skater. That connection is an important one for Dick as it was for many bicycle racers from the 1930s to the 1950s. And I discovered one more connection going back into the 1890s. I want to say something about bicycle racing back then so that we can kind of make a comparison you know, compare and contrast, like in high school book reports and papers, and, uh, and then move forward in time. To do that, I'm going to first read a few passages from my book, Boston Cycling Craze, 1880 to 1900. The big story in that book was a woman named Kitty Knox, a biracial woman identified with the Riverside Cycle Club, a colored club in the language of that time, with racing and recreational members. Their clubhouse was at the corner of Main Street and Mass Ave in Cambridge, next door to the Union Baptist Church, still going strong. You probably recognize it as you ride by. One of the most prominent members of the club was James Harvey Conover. Harvey Conover was born in a farming village of Cranberry, New Jersey in 1869. His father died before he was born, and his widowed mother struggled. His older brothers and sisters were sent out to live with other families, and by age 11, Harvey, too, was a laborer on a nearby farm. He came to Boston about 1890, just as the cyclists got off the high wheelers and the era of the safety bicycle began, with chains and brakes and pneumatic tires, and even elementary gearing. The year 18, 1890 was a transition in racing, uh, and many of the meets actually had three classes of racers, high wheelers, tricyclists, and safety bicyclists at that time. Conover became a bicycle man, an amateur racer, bicycle activist, century ride leader, and the only black bicycle shop owner in Boston on Camden Street in the South End. The local press, including the Globe and the Herald, regularly covered bicycle activities and showed him leading rides as early as 1893. Conover, his shop dealt in bicycle sundries, repairs, rentals, and Fowler brand bicycles. He advertised his shop in uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin's monthly Woman's Era, the first newspaper ever published by and for African American women. And someone pointed out to me, but that's a man's bike frame. So uh, that's a, another little mystery for us to solve. Conover entered the great Lynn Scott Road Race of May 1895, 25 miles from James Lynn Scott's Malden Bike Shop to the intersection of Waverly Oaks Road and Linden Street in Waltham and back. Race followed what today is Route 60, pretty much. And the two biggest hazards were trying to beat the freight trains crossing in West Medford and Arlington Center. Uh, most of them did so successfully. The race was anticipated as one of the greatest bicycling events ever, and the reporting from it will give you a feel for the bicycle craze. According to the Boston Journal, Malden was in gala attire. Thousands upon thousands of visitors are within her gates, and her every opportunity is being set forth to make them happy and comfortable. Shopkeepers, their clerks, their shops, and the shop windows were gaily decorated in their Sunday best, and uh, on every side, 
there is gaiety, while the merry, joyous laughter fills the air. Jim Linscott's store at the corner of Eastern Ave and Ferry Streets, just back of the starting point, where the blazing streamer overhangs the street, telling the story of events in gold letters, that's a mecca to all the wheelmen. The story, stores and streets were crowded to overflowing, with anxious bicyclists and spectators all striving to see the kings of the road, who were resting easily in their quarters, all aglow with expectation and the hope of winning the valuable trophies and glory before thousands of people, the largest <laughs> crowd ever gathered to witness an event of its kind in New England. Special electric cars were pouring into Malden from all points, north, south, east, and west, in which are hundreds and hundreds of pretty girls, men and women of all nations, all of whom instantly made a grand rush as soon as the cars stopped for vantage points from which to see the start and finish. The 246 competitors are coming out in their long robes, attended by their trainers and helpers, and as they near the starting point, they are greeted with wild cheers. Can you imagine what bicycle racing was like at the time? That gives you a feel for it. The newspapers promoted it as a monster race. To make the races more interesting, they were handicapped. The slower races got a head start. The scratch racers including Eddie McDuffie, a Nova Scotian immigrant named Nat Butler, and six others from Newark, Buffalo, and Points West. <coughs> The other but, uh, two other butlers uh, entered as well, Nat's brothers Tom and Joseph. Another Nova Scotian immigrant, Burns Pierce of Malden, also raced. Two years later, Burns Pierce, along with Nat Buffler, Butler and Tom Butler and Eddie McDuffie, teamed up with Major Taylor in a famed Boston Pursuit Team, the first ever integrated professional sports team in America. They challenged and beat a Philadelphia team at the Cambridge Cycle Track. Other racers included a young Alvin Fuller, who was a Packard and Cadillac dealer in the automobile, automobile era, a politician and eventually governor of Massachusetts. He also raced in the 1895 Linscott, and so did Harvey Conover, the Riverside cyclist. Altogether, over 100,000 people witnessed the race, and 500 wheels are accompanied by their riders. Prizes, interestingly, included a horse and harness and carriage with pneumatic tires, two house lots, and a silver service. It's an interesting set of prizes. <laughs> Notice, no cash. During the 1880s and 1890s, the gentlemen of cycling wanted to preserve their amateur status. No lower class, money grubbing professionals could be allowed. So prizes only. Of course, the racers often simply sold or pawned their prizes. They found out they would have their league credentials voided. The league magazine was full of lists of racers who had been transferred to the professional class and out of league sanctioned events. And we'll have an opportunity to revisit that 75 years later in a few moments. The racers who entered upon the league events, uh, non-league events, were suspended as well. In that same spring of 1895, the League of American Wheelmen enacted a color bar against African American cyclists, and the Boston cyclists reacted. The Massachusetts division, and especially the Boston delegation, resisted the color bar. The state legislature voted a resolution introduced by another Riverside Club member, Robert Timo, who was a Boston Globe reporter and state representative for Boston's West End. They condemned color bar as well. Parenthetically, long after the end of the bicycle craze, in 1907, Timo was the president of the short-lived Greater Boston Baseball League, including Boston's Dartmouth Athletics, Olympia athletes, and Boston's Colored Giants, the Riverside Athletics of Malden, and the Independent Athletics 
of West Medford, and finally the Oriole Athletics of West Newton. These were all communities that had significant African American populations. Harvey Conover spoke at the Charles Street Church. He was pleased that the Massachusetts Division of the LAW had been loyal to the colored man. But he warned that the colored man should, however, make the division feel that it did not forget the past and would always be watchful of the future. The Riverside Club resolved, we enter our objections and protest the rule depriving the Negro of the right of membership in the League of American Wheelmen, feeling that the discrimination is an injustice and an act of a body whose principles are based on e equity. The whole struggle, however, disappeared in the bicycling bust after 1900. The league itself virtually disappeared, carrying on primarily as a nostalgic old men's club. There they are riding around Boston. Notice their suits and ties. And, uh, <coughs> That. Um, the color bar was never mentioned again in any of the league rules or publications. It was rediscovered and formally repudiated nearly a century later. Bicycle dealers and uh, clubs went out of business and in droves. A tremendous number went out of business during that time. Until about 1908, Harvey still considered himself a bicycle dealer. But for many years after that, he was variously a garage mechanic, janitor, and followed one other avocation, which was skating. Here he is in the early 1900s, very natalie dressed on skates. <laughs> the Boston Globe noted his fine skating at Hammond Pond in January of 1901. He then became a skate sharpener and repairer starting about 1912. Activism was never far from him. In 1927, he was the contact man for the Boston Colored Giants, a semi-pro baseball team which played at fields like Playstead Park in West Medford. And I'll return to Harvey Conover in a few minutes. Now what happened though after 1900 was the tracks went down. There's a Waltham Bicycle Park, now uh, Nippermaher Park, out not far from uh, Brandeis. There is uh, the Charles River Park. It went down too in the early 1900s. Uh, the only surviving track really was the uh, Revere Beach Track, which is an oval board track. and. Uh, for uh, many years after that, it was uh, run by Nat Butler, who had been involved in the 1895 Linscott race. And after an international cycling career, he came back and started managing the uh, board track over in, over in Revere. In the 1920s, racers like Italian immigrant Vincent Pusha Madonna came up to the Oval from Providence. He and Revere's Leo Maggioli and Johnny Gallo provided a way to demonstrate Italian-American ethnic pride when it was under attack. Madonna Gallo and Revere rider Frankie Keenan specialized in motor pace racing, a fast, dangerous, and very popular event. So there's the uh, Revere Beach cycle ball. Um, Al Crossley out of New Bedford specialized, specialized in the six-day race all over the world, but little in Boston. The only six-dayer in Boston occurred in 1933 on a temporary board track in Boston Garden. But in the winter of 1937, the board track was home to a series of bicycle and midget car races. Now, if you look at the, that's the program for the event. If you looked at the uh, title of it, it looks like it's all about midget auto races. But if you go into the interiors of it, all these bicycle races were going on. And um, I'm going to ask you to pay attention to a couple of names. One is uh, Edgar Apt, who uh, we all know Scott Chamberlain cleaned up his bike, and we're going to try to put that in the Bicycle History Archive. He's there as one of the race officials. 
Walter Greenquist is another longtime official, and uh, I'm sure Dick will talk a little bit about him later. You'll also see the name of the clerk there, Leon Landry. That's the, that's the Landry that we're all familiar with. He started a bicycle shop in Franklin, Mass, in 1920 or thereabouts, and was really a great sponsor of races. A couple of other names that are in there you may or may not be able to see. One is uh, Palmer. Uh, there's Don Palmer, and that's, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, Frances Palmer, that's her brother, and that's who got her into racing. Uh, a couple of Wolners are there. These are great racers out of uh, Worcester. And finally, the name Billy Vandell, or William Vandell, who's the second in the list there. Um, he is the only surviving racer from these events. Billy Vandell out of New Bedford, he was voted the, or made the uh, record as the New England best all-arounder in 1938. He remembered when I interviewed him a few years ago, the heavy smell of exhaust and gasoline from the midget cars. Billy will be 100 next spring, and he will be honored by the city of New Bedford. And uh, we'll keep you informed. He's quite a man. Also in the 1930s, the connection between bicycle racing and speed skating developed. And here is a picture. There is a picture from the uh, scrapbook of uh, Lou and Bob Hall. That's Bob Hall in 1941. He looks to be about seven or eight years old, speed skating. And in the picture below, he's racing, I think, probably in Providence, where they were from as a 12 year older and so he represents in a way the bringing together of those those two sports this is the Bob, Bob Hall was one of Dick's racing buddies and I'm sure he'll talk more about him a little later athletes could compete compete in both summer and winter and New England was prominent among uh, athletes with this combination of speed skating and bicycling What's striking, if you look back at the programs of race meets, is that in contrast to the 1890s, the striking contrast is how few New England racers there were at the national level. And within New England, how few Boston racers. In the 1941 Yankee Wheelman Road Classic, uh, sponsored by the Yankee Wheelman Club out of Providence, not one Boston club showed up. So you see Brockton, North Quincy, Middlesex County, Fall River, and Cambridge. There were even two rival clubs from Worcester. One of them, the Sprocketeers, featuring skater cyclist Joe Cote, a leading rider just before he went off to war. The Amateur Bicycle League of America championship meet records from 1920 to 1960 show only one New England racer among the top three finalists. And that was Art Longo in 19, 1955. So with that background of New England's weakness as a weight racing region for many years, and with a strong speed skating, bicycle racing connection, I want to set Dick up to talk about how things develop after, after that. And that involves returning to the story of Harry Conover. African American bike racer, activist, and shop owner in the 1890s. Fast forward to the 1940s. Harvey moved to St. Batal Street in the South End and opened up Conover Skate Hospital, a basement store specializing in repair and sharpening. One day I was up in uh, Chelmsford, North Chelmsford, I had. Uh, to see Dick, and after learning more about Dick's skating career, I mentioned in passing Conover's name as someone involved in both sports. So you can imagine that I felt like I died and gone to heaven when Dick said, I knew him. A direct connection from 1895 to today. I went back to my home office and did a newspaper search for Conover, and there he was, in his skate shop on St. Patal Street, mm -hmm. skates in hand, having just been robbed. That's the only 
current picture that I have of uh, Harvey Conover. So here's from the manuscript for my second book, Boston's 20th Century Cycling Renaissance, where I introduced Dick Ring. Dick Ring was the son of a Pittsfield blacksmith. His father lost everything in the Depression and to survive came to work at the Charleston Navy Yard as war preparations started up in the late 1930s. In February 1948, a 17-year-old Brighton High student walked into the basement skate shop on St. Patolph Street in South Boston South End. Ring was getting ready for the state meet just a few blocks away at Boston Arena. Shop proprietor James Harvey Conover, an expert in shape, skate sharpening, was willing to meet the individual needs of the local racers. Ring did not know of Conover's life in the 1890s as a well-known local racer, defender of the rights of black cyclists and bike shop owner, all lost in the bicycling bust. Conover adapted with a different skill, skating. Neither of them could have foreseen Ring's future as a leading racer, racing club leader, coach, and race school founder, and his role as the dean of bicycle race and speed skating announcers in the region. I'm going to let Dick tell the story of his encounter with Harvey, Harvey Conover, and then we'll show some more pictures from the 1950s and get Dick to react to them. They feature his skater cycling buddies, Charlie Hewitt, Buddy Dodd, Lou and Bob Hall, Joe Cote, Art Lonjo, Al Broadhurst, the U.S. Army Racing Team, and all the rest. And then we'll ver venture into the 1960s and beyond. So, here's another view of Joe and Dick versus the horse and sulky. And I'm going to ask Dick, uh, how'd you happen to be there at the track on Soldiers Field Road, number one? And number two, why were you dressed in slacks? What took place on that morning, I had been out for a ride, and when I got home, I received a phone call from a friend of mine that was just getting started in speed skating, and he wanted a lesson in how to sharpen them. We sharpen our own skates, and you had a rack that would hold them so that both blades were perfect upside down, and you had stones, and we got our sharpening stones from Norton Company out in Worcester, and you polished them, took care of the radiuses, and <clears throat> I was on my way over to his house, and Joe Cody, I saw this crowd of people down on the sulky track directly across the street from the Boston Skating Club on Soldiers Field Road. Joe waved me over. I said, Joe, what do you got going? He says, ah, oh, man, it's a pretty exciting day. The only thing, I'm wondering if you can help me out. I need somebody to ride with me. We're going to race a sulky. I said, yeah, sure. Needless to say, I've got dungarees on. I do have cycling shoes, no cycling shorts, no helmet, no gloves. And I said, yeah, sure, let's give it a go. So we went over, we talked to the gentleman on the, on the sulky, and I said, don't kill us out there, <laughs> because we're on a track, there's a sulky track, it's dirt. You people, I'm sure, in your rides over the years have gotten caught in dirt, sand, and whatever. And it gets pretty slippery. So you got to pay attention to what's going on out there, let alone race a horse. So that was great fun. We had uh, a good time. And uh, Joe ended up beating me, but the horse beat both of us. And it was basically a, a real fun day because the crowd, they had never seen a bicycle race a sulky. So that, <laughs> that, was, that was a wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, as far as... That, then I went back to my friend's house and showed him how to shop in a pair of skates. <laughs> there you go. All in a day's work. Well, now, not too long after that, you... Uh, you got into, uh, we'll repeat that picture of you on a bike and also on your skates. Tell us more about that. You, the, the, you, that's when you're in the Army, isn't it? Yes. I'll backtrack just a little bit back to the, the picture of Joe and I. On that particular day, I was 17 years old at that point. I had just come off a wonderful season on speed skating. 
and everything just clicked. And I had made my way out to uh, Lansing, Michigan, to the college out there for the North American Speed Skating Championships, and I had saved all my money, and I caddied during the summers and shoveled snow during the winter, and it turned a buck anyway I could to pay, to pay for entry fees and get me to speed skating championships, Lake Placid, any Saratoga, Glens Falls. We had a circuit that we followed that was quite unique, and it took us on an adventure every winter. So I was in, physically I was in, in very, very good shape that year, um, in, in on a high, but... Uh, you know, as far as uh, the speed skating and the bicycle racing, I started speed skating in 1943. The Record American newspaper, which was in Boston years and years ago, Ben Levius was the director of the newspaper. 1939, he started the Silver Skates Derby, and he held that outdoors on a flooded area. And... The following year, in 1940, he brought it indoors to the Boston Garden. When I started in 1943, <clears throat> you get your newspaper, cut out your entry blank, 25 cents. So Gene Toffinelli, my training partner, who grew up in Brighton with me, <clears throat> we said, hey, you know, we've never been into the Boston Garden. That'd be a treat. So we cut the entry out and... You if you want mailed it into the Boston Garden, got our number, you know, 1107 or whatever. I mean, they had thousands of skaters and made our way into the Boston Garden. <clears throat> and that was a treat. And you're talking 16,000 people. They had a train that would go to the town of Wilmington because they had a very, very big speed skating contingent. And they would bring the whole town down to the North Station and dump them off, and the place was just rocking. It was absolutely phenomenal atmosphere. And, of course, at that time, I was, what, nine years old, eight, nine years old? Of course, you know, kind of scared to death, and you're out on the ice, and you're looking at these thousands of people, and, you know, bang, your gun is off, and you're skating a couple of laps for your heat, taking spills and whatever. And at the end of the day... We get to stick around and we watch the pros skate. That was the time that I got hooked on speed skating. We stayed and watched the pros. And they would just float across the ice at speeds you wouldn't believe inside of a hockey rink. And I had made up my mind then. I said, someday I'm going to learn how to skate like these guys. And that was my uh, premise to, you know, get into the sport and stay with it. So a lot of bumps in the road, but I finally got to where I wanted to go. So how did that early experience lead you to bicycle racing? When I was training down at the Boston Skating Club, that was the only place on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday night, that was the only public skating in the area. And it was 90 cents to get in. We were scrambling to get the 90 cents. And again, you know, shovel snow in the winter, do anything to get the 90 cents to get down to the Boston Skating Club. We didn't have money enough to take a bus. I lived in up off of Oak Square in Brighton, and Gene, Toff, and Ali and I would walk. So it would probably be a three, four-mile walk to get there. But that's okay. We looked at that as being part of training. We were going to get a lot tougher that way. Um, and so that is how we got onto the ice as then we started to get uh, involved in talking to some of the people, Al Broadhurst, yeah. Georgie Primpus, yeah. uh, Bobby Swanbon, all of those were very good local skaters. And we would watch them and try to chase them around. That was fruitless. I mean, they just skate away from you three strides and they're up the, up the ice and you're still scrambling. And eventually we got to know them and then some older skaters offered to take us to some outdoor speed skating championships. And one of them, the first time I met the Halls, was down at Roger Williams Park in Rhode Island. And that was a thrill to me. 
you know, here you are, a kid off a rink, you don't really, really know, know the game of skating. And it'd be like uh, uh, Billy McCarthy getting into his first bicycle race. He doesn't know really what's going on, but he, he's got an idea. And it, it's a thrill for him to get into a starting line and get into competition. And finally, these skaters clued us in. If you want to make an Olympic team, a national team representing the United States, you better get yourself an activity for the summer. We all bicycle race for the summer. So that's basically what started the wheels turning in my head. Now I have to get enough money to buy a bicycle. And I talked to the Broadhurst brothers. They had a small bike shop in Rosendale. And they were great, great speed skaters. And then Al Broadhurst in 1949 was a BAR, Best All-Around Rider Competition in the United States, where if any one of you were going to make a, de a design on, in 2018, you were going to go for a BAR championship, you would have to travel to St. Louis, Detroit, Chicago, California, and... Henry Rogers held one in Burlington, Massachusetts. And that's Henry Rogers in that. That's Henry Rogers holding, holding Listen, Joe. And right? I never knew the knew until later that Henry Rogers was a six day bike racer. He's the gentleman holding me on that picture. He was a speed skating coach. That's all I knew that he speed skated. Until we get into the sport of bike racing, then I found his background. So this is how we got started into the sport of bicycle. One thing, I had a person ask me, what do you like better? Do you like speed skating or do you like bike racing? Well, down deep, I still had a passion for speed skating, but I said as a remark, I don't have to shovel snow to get a speed skating track. All I can do is jump on a bicycle and you're on a road. So you don't have to do any shoveling. It's a lot easier as far as training is concerned. Take us another step further and talk a little bit about your... Uh, I know you got into the Army and... Uh... I, get, I, I get into the Army and I went to signal school and down at uh, Camp Gordon, down in Georgia. And some people, they found that I ended up with, uh, had a background in speed skating. And after signal school, we're out in a big uh, parade field and they call, you know, individuals, uh, Bill McCarthy, Korea. Uh, Dick Ring might go to uh, somewhere else. But I went to Korea. So off I went by boat, served a term uh, over in Korea. And Captain Crapo from Worcester was my company commander. We're up in the hills. We're on the DMZ line. That was our job, was patrolling the DMZ line. And he called me down out of the message center and down to his office. He says, who do you know? <laughs> I said, uh, I, I, I'm not getting your drift. He says, sit down. He said, you come from Brighton, right? He came from Worcester. And he said, I'm very familiar with the Worcester 50. He said, the bike race up there on Route 9, Lake Ave, and they held it every year, Worcester Telegraph and Gazette. And he said, read these orders. There were orders there that wanted me back at Oakland Army <laughs> Terminal for the Army cycling team. <laughs> I said, oh boy. Wow. Here's a picture of the... Uh, this is this is all good. This is a picture here of the parts of the cycling I'm going to team. ride my way through the rice paddies and get out of here. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I made my way uh, back, back to California and that's when I had my skates, I had to go home, get my bikes, and Buddy Dodd was going out with a station wagon. He lived in Quincy and he took my road bike and I said, I got a couple other bikes that I can train on and I'll see you out in California in a few weeks. And I hooked up with him and then I went down to Lakewood. I brought my skates with me because I still had a passion for skating. There was a small rink in Lakewood and some people and also some officers from the base 
were down there skating, they got talking to me and whatever. And so they decided to do a story in the Army Times. And that's where they came down, and I'm on ice. I'm, I'm at the skating rink in Lakewood. And uh, so they did a, a real neat story, and it, it worked out very well. But the fun was that summer being on the Army cycling team, and we had quite a crew. We traveled, we broke during the course of Buddy Dodd was on the team, and they were... The, I think he's pictured there, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, Buddy Dodd is, is the second, second one in. George Van Meter, the first one on the left, six foot four. I had run into George when, when I was growing up in speed skating. I would run into him in a, a national or North American championship on skates and also on the bike. He was a great athlete, very, very good. His first big command out of OCS, he is going to be in charge of a bicycle team. So he, he thought that was neat too. But with the connections that he had with the Air Force, that they were, as long as we let them know on a Wednesday where we were going to go, we were going to go up to uh, the state of Washington, uh, we were going to go to Detroit, wherever we wanted to go, they would fly us there. Because they were, say you people were pilots, well, to collect your per diem and pay for your endeavors in the service, you would have to put in X amount of flying miles. You didn't care where you flew. So as long as we let them know on a Wednesday, we could get a flight to wherever the race was. So we basically had the game by the tail. We were golden for that whole summer. Let me broaden this a little bit, Dick, and ask this question. In the 1890s and on, um, you know, there was a sharp line, or supposed to be a sharp line, between professional and amateur athletics. And that was a real problem because in the Olympics, with Avery Brundage on, Brundage on top of it all, it was, uh, you know, a real death on, on professional sports. Um, the U.S. was getting beaten by the Russian and Eastern European Real teams bad. who were state-sponsored. <laughs> and finally, the whole idea came up, well, let's have a U.S. Army cycling the, the team. The Navy had a team, the Army had a team, and the Air Force had a team. So we had the whole game covered. Now we're back to Lou Hall. He mentioned the fact about Bobby Hall and Lou Hall out of Rhode Island. Lou Hall was an official for speed skating and also for bicycle racing. And he kept things going in New England. And evidently, the military, the Pentagon, contacted all the district reps throughout the United States for the, United, for the Amateur Bicycle League of America. And <clears throat> he gave Buddy Dodd's name and my name to the organization down in the Pentagon. And that is why uh, Captain Crapo ended up with this document, get ring back to the Oakland Army Terminal. <laughs> we need them. So it was really, really a good connection. And it was all because of Lou Hall, that he had to give names of people that would be qualified. We had a national ranking and we were in the top ten in the, in, the, in the nation. So it's not a case that you just pick somebody out of a crowd. So you had to have something to back it up. During the course of that summer, we took the 125 mile record, we broke it four times. Now take, there's four people over here. You're number one, number two, three, four, five, six, seven, we had eight of us on the team. Each one of us had a number. We had a system going that was second to none. We're going to start the race off. It's going to be a 116-mile road race. We play with them for 80 miles. Just sit there and then after the 80-mile mark, number one, you're gone. You're going up the road. You're going to go at 75%. You know we're going to catch you. So we, the rest of us on the team, we sit there and we let the field drive hard. The minute they catch them, you're number two. You're gone. 
you're up the road. We kept picking away at them, picking away at them. By the time we get down into last 15 miles, they don't have a pair of legs under them. And then we're coming out to play. So as a result, we broke that record four times, lowered it for the United States record. And George Van Meter, we, we thought he was kidding us, but every Monday, he had to sit down at his desk and fill out a report as to how we performed wherever we were on that weekend. And he had to keep a record. And we had to prove our worth to the United States government. Otherwise, we were gone. Back to Korea? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so needless to say, we stayed in California. Let me follow up on that, Dick. That whole business of professional and amateur and whatnot, and that was one way the U.S. government was trying to deal with it, was to get you all in the Army or the Air Force or whatever. There was another way that folks tended to deal with that, and let me just introduce there. Here's a little cartoon. That shows the... Uh, Quebec to Montreal race, and I want you to, you know, there's a little cartoon of it, but uh, tell me about your own experience with that, and why you did it, and how that might have had something to do with uh, making money. The Quebec to, to Montreal, number one, we would race in Canada. We raced a lot of stage races, and a lot of criteriums, and road races. Because of Avery Brundage, we crossed the border. We aren't too far from the border. So for us to, after a day's work, jump in a car, a game as four of us, throw in for gas money and off we go, and see if we could make some money in a stage race. The Quebec to Montreal was usually in September at the end of the year. 176 miles, not kilometers, miles. Hotel Fontenac, that was the start of Quebec City. The parliamentary buildings down in Montreal, that was the finish line. And it was a good, if the wind was heading the wrong way and we were eating, eating the wind for the 176 miles, it made for a very, very difficult day. So, and Art Longsjo ended up uh, winning it. We assisted him in a win, we assisted him in two wins, and it was in 1959, that 1958, that <clears throat> Art ended up winning it, and he stayed over for a television show on Monday morning. We had to head home because of work and whatever. And that's an Art Long show was 26 years old. He was the first athlete in the United States to make two Olympic teams in one year. 1956, he represented the United States and Cortina, Italy in the Winter Olympics. He and I, we went through the Eastern Trials and out to St. Paul for the final trials and I was an alternate on the team, he made the team. And he came back from that, in the meantime I had gotten drafted. So I was in the service and we were stationed at, at the Oakland Army Terminal after cycling. And I contacted Art, and we were going to have the Olympic trials out there in, on, in Oakland area. And it was very, going to be a very, very difficult course. I told Art, I talked to the mess sergeant. His name was King. So I had a conversation with him. We were in a barracks that up on the second floor, there weren't too many people there. And I, I explained the situation of Art coming from Fitchburg, didn't have hardly any money at all. They took up a collection in Fitchburg, got him plane fare to get out there. Buddy Dodd and I met Art at the plane, got him over to the Oakland Army Terminal. We had him all set up in the barracks with us, had him all set up for food. You know, Sergeant <laughs> King, we introduced him to Art. Art ended up making that team. I was an alternate on that team. Art ended up representing the United States in Melbourne, Australia. Represented the United States in two Olympic teams in the same year. When I got out of the service, we started to travel again together. We had been traveling since we were 13 years old, speed skating and, and then started in bike racing in the 50s. So Art and I were pretty tight. And <clears throat> 
after that second run at the Quebec to Montreal that he won, I mentioned that we drifted back home because we had to get to work. We get word later that day, Art got killed. His driver, going down through North Hero, Vermont, it was a storm, real, real bad rainstorm. And a, somehow, don't ask me, in the rain or whatever, a bee get in the car. And Robinson, who was driving, Art was asleep on the passenger side. I saw a picture of the car wrapped around the utility pole. He went off the road, and Art was killed. And that is when they started the Longshore Classic. In 19, it took him a year to get going. Guy Moran, who uh, was the director sportif for the Baggio Topato team, this fellow Baggio owned a bicycle shop. Topado, which Pete Mooney will tell you, is the name of a bike frame. It's a bike company. And they had a racing team. Anytime we went to Canada, Buddy Dodd and Art would race for the Paggio Topado. And Charlie Hewitt, myself, and Bill Brady would race for the Northeast Bike Club. Mm -hmm. So Let me get into that Northeast Bike Club. Right now, that is a program from the. Uh, that's a program from Hartford, and the uh, races that went on down there in Hartford Cole, for a that number of years. Pa Cole Park? That's Cole Park, and I remember there's a story that you told about uh, Cole Park and your entry into some of the races down there, and how that led you to start up the Northeast Bicycle Club. So tell us about that. Well, the Northeast Bike Club, <clears throat> and also when I get out of the service, uh, Buddy Dodd and I, we were looking at one another. We went to a race and say this gentleman was the register, and he looked up at us and he said, that'll be another three, th three bucks. I looked at him, for what? Well, you don't belong to a club. No. So we ponied up the three dollars. Buddy and I laughed. We look at one another. We're going back to the car to get our bikes off the roof rack. And we're saying, next week we're going to have a club. <laughs> we had a friend of ours that was a lawyer. In one week, we formed the Northeast Bike Club. 1957. It was in July, July of 1950. Tail end of July, 1957. We said, we aren't going to get done again. So, basically that's how the Northeast Bike Club got formed and why it got formed. What was the role of uh, uh, Walter Greenquist? Was he involved in that? And, now, uh, and uh, Eugene Gaston? <coughs> I've heard those names associated before, with that. Before we went in the service, now they talk about the uh, New England area be, being after the 1900s, Larry, that things were going downhill. We were very, very fortunate. There were a lot of clubs in New England. And in those clubs, a lot of very enthusiastic people. And they would form races on different evenings, time trials, criteriums, whatever, to keep us going. And the Northeast Bike Club, we had a training race out at Hanscom Field, and we had another one club out of Fitchburg, we would run <clears throat> the uh, sprint races on Thursday night, and Sal Ardania out of Fitchburg, I coordinated with him, he would run a criterium at Fort Devens on Tuesday, I would run the sprint races on Thursday. So that took care of the riders' needs, so when they traveled to an event, at least they had some mileage in their legs. So. It, because of the enthusiasm and riders being innovative that we kept cycling going here in the New England area. Right. And it was a hotbed. Right. right. Yeah. It certainly became that in the 50s. Now there's another shot there. Uh, I had always thought that uh, motor pace had uh, ended in the 1930s, so imagine my surprise to see this photograph from the 1950s and it looks like, I think it's Bob Hall trailing the uh, motorcycle there. Uh, we're not sure where that is, whether that was uh, New Jersey 
or Westboro, and but I want you to talk a little bit about what went on in Westboro. Now back to Walter Greenquist, who was a great ally, because we would go up to training sessions at Webster Square in Worcester on Sunday mornings. We would have people coming down from Maine, from Biddeford and Saco, Maine, and all the way over to Worcester on, on Sunday mornings for the speed skating workouts, long show, and the whole game, because we were all there. And <clears throat> they were good to get you prepared for the season upcoming. And Walter Greenquist somehow got the key to the Westboro Auto Track. We're in business. So Joe Cody and our group from the Northeast Bike Club and a gang of us would get together and every Sunday morning we used the Westboro um, auto track and we weren't any disturbance to the neighbors because on Sunday mornings bicycles, they don't make any noise. As a result, we held a lot of championships out there. And that's the first time that Art get into bicycle racing, it was 1953 or 54. He rode down from Fitchburg to the track. We were holding the uh, New England championships on the track. And Art rode to the track. I didn't know he was in the, getting into bike racing. You ever hear the, the term penny loafers? You, you had a loafer and, it, and you put a penny in there. Art get off his bike and we're all shooting the breeze with him and he had an old Schwinn it looked like it you know was in a junkyard and uh, you know he cleaned it up a little bit and we had been training on the track we knew nothing about what Art had been doing on his own up in Fitchburg Art cleaned our clock that day inside outside over us under us around us through us didn't make any difference he had so much speed he didn't know what to do with it that's when he ended up, uh, what were you saying, 1955. That's when he ended up third in the national championships. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Hewitt uh, took, a, took a bad spill out there. And he, he ended up in a, a little bit of trouble. He went up into the bleaches and, you know, crossed the bleaches. And, oh, man, he was, he was in agony, the spill that he took. I have my but, own memories of, of Westboro, by the way, watching demolition derbies out there. Exactly. <laughs> At that same time. Uh, Dick, I want to switch gears just for a little bit and uh, talk about the um, whole idea of women's racing. And uh, this is a picture, by the way, from 1937, which has to do with uh, Frances Palmer, who I mentioned before. <laughs> She is the third from the left there, and uh, she was the, the best all-arounder of uh, New England, but really got crushed in the Nationals, and uh, was one of the very few women riders in New England and during the 30s. But then, I think it began to come up again when they passed that Title IX of the Higher Education Act, and more women got involved in sports more generally, and one woman who you know um, told me that there were few colleges at the time that had cycling teams, but women got actively recruited to a broad variety of sports, learned the fun of competition and teamwork, and that it was okay to get hot and sweaty. <laughs> so participation in cycle racing came later, and it was coaches like you that were ready and willing and encouraging them at, at your North American School of Bicycling. And one of them told me, said, they said, if the women were dropped while racing in the men's division, he would create a special preem for them, encouraging them all the more. So tell us a little bit about your school, your coaching, and especially your coaching of women. Bill Farrell and I started the North American School of Bicycle Racing in 1978. We were, uh, we ran all kinds of camps before that, and we said, you know, these people out on the road, they're going to get themselves killed. They step on a starting line, they have no idea of what's going on. They're a danger to themselves, they are a danger to everybody around them. And I said, that's why you have carnage sometimes on the start of a bicycle race. So 
Bill and I started the North American School of Bike Racing up in New Hampshire, and eventually we went to Waterville Valley. The Cochran family were very friendly with Bill. Bill was on the Can-Am ski team, and I mean, he was a, a great international skier. And, of course, the, uh, the people up at Waterville Valley, the Cochran family raced with Billy. They wanted us up there. So we had the lodge, the ski uh, school lodge. They have a ski school up there, similar to Burke Mountain, that, you know, the kids, the, they come up and they go to school there and they race out of there, they train out of there. So they let us use the school during the course of the summer. And it worked out very well for us. And Shelley Lutz and a few more women went to our school. And then I would see them every weekend at the races because I was traveling New England at that time, every weekend announcing bike races. And they knew the numbers were down for women. I knew they were down. So we had a little conference and we we're saying, how can we bring these numbers up? So Billy and I jumped in. We said, well, we can start this thing going by running a weekend school, three-day weekend school, and see if we can get some interest going that way. So we started at the bottom and we had them at our school. And then things started to evolve and the snowball started to roll. So then, Jerry Moriarty, Kelly Ayotte, that was later a senator in Washington, out of New Hampshire, and uh, they got together with, with myself and Bill, and we helped them out. I went to, uh, at that time, Grace Jones, and then uh, Diane Fortini, and I said, listen, what's happening here in women's races? You get, say, you gals got on a starting line and you hadn't been racing. Now you're in with, with maybe a half a dozen or 16 or 18 real good pro riders. What are they going to do to you? They're going to smoke you. You know it. I know it. Now I'm not announcing bike races. I'm watching this thing happen. So <clears throat> I said to Grace, would you mind, and then if you get lapped, you get pulled. Katie by the door, you're gone. So your day is over. And I said, listen, they, they can learn how to race a bicycle. If they can't, race some laps. You're pulling them, they get no experience whatsoever. Would it be okay with you? I, I will talk with the women riders. And I will set something up to make it safe for everybody. So Grace Jones, she had the confidence in me from running the bike school and the whole bit. I got all the gals at a meeting. And I explained them what was going to happen. I said, now, if you, 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 you get dropped from the field, stay together. Stay together. Let these gals go. Form your own, own field. You're not going to get pulled. When the field comes on you and I haul a track, the only thing you have to keep in your mind when I haul a track, that means the field, the, the heavy hitters are coming up on you and they're going to be lapping you. Get to the outside of the track. That means you could be go to the left or the right. Go to the outside of the track. Stay there in a group until the heavy hitters get by you. Then continue racing as a group. And that's what Larry was talking about, that I would tout the, the powers of these women competitors just starting out and the guts that they had to get on a starting line in a sport they know nothing about. And as a result, they had a lot of fun because I was getting money up for them for preems. And it worked out very well. Everybody behaved themselves, and all the officials went along with it, and because they did, and I explained this, if we blow this, I said, you gals are back to square one. Everybody cooperated, 
and you wouldn't believe in the course of three seasons the amount of women competitors we had on the starting line. Category 1, 2, 3, and Category 4. It was an absolutely wonderful atmosphere in New England. And it continues to grow. You mentioned uh, your announcing. And uh, I know that there's a story around the Lonjo that involves your uh, beginnings of uh, bicycle race announcing. And I want you to share that. Somewhere along the line, <clears throat> you're, in, you're in a two sports that you feel very, very fortunate. Between speed skating and bike racing, I was the luckiest guy in the world as far as I was concerned. I was on the starting line in the front row. You earned that because you placed in the top ten the year before. That is your privilege. Thousands of people in Fitchburg. Fitchburg, the, the, the town just loaded with people for the Long Show Classic. Riders come in from all over the country and, and all the riders down from Canada. Olympic team members, the whole bit. We had a full house. <clears throat> I'm on the line and I'm feeling privileged, man, this is neat. Finally made it up to the front row here. Terry Longshow, this is when uh, Art had just passed away. She said, uh, I've got a problem. I said, uh, what can I do for you, Terry? She said, uh, Herb Hoffman from the Amateur Bicycle League of America, ABL of A, he didn't show up. He says, we're stuck. I said, no problem. I said, what to do? Stall him for about five minutes. My car was around the corner. I got off the starting line, went around the corner, put my bike in the boot, and walked back up onto the podium. And I'm still in my cycling short shirts, jersey, helmet, the whole bit. Took my helmet off. They handed me a mic, and we were off and running. And I have announced that bike race for 54 years. And I gotta but, say that your reputation goes before you, and I'm convinced uh, two things. One is you always make it interesting. I think you could make a ham sandwich interesting, <laughs> or maybe a rising tide, something, and that you've been so full of stories. And I'm also told that at least some of them are true. <laughs> You know, one thing, a crowd is watching a bike race, and I always used to take the premise that if uh, some local town person is going down the store for a loaf of bread and they stop to watch the bike race on their way home with the loaf of bread, before they get to their house, they're going to be a connoisseur of bicycle racing. They're going to know what's going on, why it's going on, team tactics, who is who in the bike race, who to watch for, preems, what they're all about, and just keep them well informed while the race was going on. So to me, it was a great deal of fun. And uh, one last uh, little piece on that, and, and what I want to show you there, I don't know if you can read it, I'll read it to you. Uh, after a long career, uh, bicycle race announcing, um, Dick Ring uh, wrote a little note to himself, which he had secreted away in a file that I dug out and uh, I want to read it to you because it's kind of interesting and I think a really nice note. He says, well folks, Dick Ring has crossed the finish line. It was a fantastic ride that took me through many picturesque towns and scenic villages. Sure was a remarkable trip along the highways and byways of New England. Forty years that spanned five decades of announcing championship cycling events will leave me with many extraordinary memories. Remarkable friendships that were kindled over a span of many years will be cherished till the end of time. In closing, I would like to say thanks for letting me be part of your world, the world of championship bicycle racing. As my era ends, a new era begins. Always Dick Ring, the voice of New England cycling. My farewell to announcing, September 2003, just returning from a cyclocross event in Pittsfield, Mass., a beautiful sunny day. He wrote that in 2003, and uh, I saw him announcing uh, <laughs> very, very recently. So uh, I want to, Dick, would you sort of reflect on, on this wonderful letter, by the way, uh, that you sent to yourself? And, yeah. uh, and uh, I do that sort of how you, time. you know, I don't need a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> and how you took it back? It 
I can remember that day like it was yesterday. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous fall day. I was born in Pittsfield, and I was asked to go up and announce their cycle cross event. And Mike Ward, and I had done it for quite a few years. And I'm thinking to myself on the during the course of the event, I'm saying, you know, I says I've been talking about and thinking about wrapping it up. I said, if there's ever a day, today is the day. It is absolutely beautiful. So I, at the beginning of the day, I made it, you know, made up my mind as to what I was going to do. Last, the pro race got on. Mark and Mike and uh, Frank McCormick were there. All the heavy hitters in cyclocross. And while the race is going on, I'm saying to myself, Dick, you know, this is, this is it. You know, you pick the spot. The day is gorgeous. I said, the competition is fierce. I said, bring him into the finish line and let's end it. And I did. And I can remember Frank and Mark McCormick breaking away from the field. And I'm saying, two laps to go, two to go. And I brought him down, a bell lap, bell lap. And I'm thinking to myself, after they shot on by, going out, and I'm saying, this is my last lap. Hmm. I'm going to announce a bike race. This is it. So they crossed the finish line, gave all the awards, and everybody's drifting out, going home, and the helpers are picking up the stakes and whatever, and I'm wrapping up all my cables, taking my speakers down, packing everything in the car, went up over the Mohawk Trail, a nice ride home, made my way back to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and told my wife, and that night, I sat down and wrote that in my logbook. And I don't know how you ever found it, number one. And so, I've been the possessor of the Dick Ring archive for the last two years. He calls me up every once in a while and says, where is it? Do you still have it? <laughs> sure, you'll get it back. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, one of those those days. And then all of a sudden, I was getting, getting uh, phone calls from... Uh, Jack Chapman and a few more friends of mine, and then Alan Cote called me up. He said, "You know, we could use another announcer at Fitchburg. Uh, you know, would you would you help us out?" And so I do. I jump in every now and then, and I was out to Fruitland Museum, and yeah. what a what a beautiful venue. Any of you people go out to the cycle cross out there? Yeah. And it's spectacular. My daughter met you out there yes. a couple of years ago. It was yes. really a, quite a great event. I, I mentioned it to her today on the phone. Yeah. She said, well, say a little dick for me, would you? <laughs> Boy, there's an athletic-looking gal. Man, oh, man. <laughs> she looks curly. Oh, she looks like a racehorse. Yeah. Good <laughs> Lord. <sighs> I'd rather chase the wind than try to chase her. <laughs> but it, the sport of cycling... Uh, one thing I, I always mention, that if you belong to a club, and if they're holding, whether they're, uh, they're a century ride in the fall, and they need people at the feed station or whatever, volunteer your services. Think back at all the enjoyment you got from this sport. And, when it, and I would tell this to people at our bike racing school. Put a little, just a little bit, back into the, into the sport. I said, you'll feel good about yourself, but you'll be contributing to making this sport last a little bit longer. So, Thank you, Dick. We're going to have some Q&A now. Who would like to raise a question? Anything. Yes. Back when, when you were in the United States Service, you were out in Oak Station, Oak Island. What did you ride for bicycles at the time? What was your gearing? And did you guys have full army kits that you rode in? No. We, oh, kits of clothing, yes. Our bicycles, we provided our own, our own bicycles, our own favorite bikes. And so I had a friend of mine that was a frame builder. And so I was, I was riding his frame. And then uh, I could frame build it. That, that's a whole other story. I remember when Peter came back from England. And any of you people seen his product, a Beep Mooney? Oh, sure. Gorgeous, gorgeous frames. 
that that's that's another story. But um, so you financed all, all the equipment, all your gear, your maintenance. They they your took. Own, uh, your own oh equipment. no, they they took care of all our expenses as far as um, traveling, the bike, the whole bit. Um, so we didn't have to worry about anything, and that was wonderful. The, the only thing you had to worry about every day, do you have enough air in your tires? That was the big problem of the day. So, and you adjusted from there. But it was nice to have somebody take care of you. Now, Larry mentioned about Avery Brundage. I started speed skating, as I mentioned, back in 1943. All through most of my skating career, I had to deal with Avery Brundage. He was a very wealthy individual. He believed in everybody should be an amateur. As I mentioned before, earlier, that's why we would slip over the border and race in Canada and make some money. And in speed skating... Could you make it under your own name? No. We, we, never, never under our own name. Uh, what Frank, name did you choose, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. The, <laughs> Buzzy Schreiberg. The, the, no, it, seriously. Um, you know, I had a I had a fictitious name, and Buddy Daw did, and, and all of us did. Did the United States military ever use your information or your riding skills on troop transport? Was there ever an application used, or were you just purely athletic? We just you were still soldiers at heart. Correct? Oh, absolutely. But did you ever? Were you ever asked? Because when the, when the whole deal was friends? done, when that when that bike race deal was done, I had to finish out my time up at Fort Lewis. But never, I, the, never the two met. You never did any training on a bike to uh, for uh, defending the country. So no, no, just just for bike racing. And as Larry had mentioned, <clears throat> they copied what Russia was doing and getting away with making sure that they had a good team. But we all, I got drafted. I mean, it wasn't a case that I joined. I got drafted, just like, you know, if you get your draft note. I was in Canada at a stage race, and my mom called me up. She said, Dick, you better get home. I said, why? We got to, you know, I want to finish the stage race. We might stay for another one. She said, the government wants you. So I had to come home, go into Boston, and get on a bus and go to Fort Devens and go to basic training. Get out of basic training and then went to uh, Camp Gordon to signal school and then from there went to Korea. So that was my my little little hop. So other questions? Anybody else? Go ahead, get another one. I'm I'm happy to say that Mr. Dick Ring has announced me racing up in London Dairy, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm at the track races up there. Okay. He pointed out a bike I brought up there, an old Schwinn, an old uh, Raleigh. I remember you, call up, you called me out on it and said, thanks for putting that back to you and get it out on the road again. But um, I, I don't know much about what's going on up there and how come we don't have a cycle, cross, I mean, a cycle track here in Boston with all the universities and all of the energy we have and the young people. Why don't we have a cycle track in, anywhere in the Northeast? The closest in... We've Pittsburgh, wondered that Montreal. for years. I can recall when John, Alice, and I we're looking for a venue <clears throat> for an indoor track or an outdoor track or something. Speaking about the track, you people, if you're not familiar with the, uh, in Londonderry, the, there is a cycling track. From what I understand, Bill, uh, does the Northeast Bike Club have the website? Yes, there is a site. Uh it's like the New England Velodrome or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, and in fact, not these bike club threw a few bucks in and uh, they, they resurrected the track this year. This year? Uh -huh. Of course, it's a lease deal because it's actually uh, uh, a go kart track. Yeah, right, it was a go kart uh, track. And uh, um, they, they, the fellow that owns the property you know, opens up that lease every year. So they'll have to work the lease deal again next year. But it's got some momentum. Um, they started some track racing again this year, and uh, you know, hopefully something uh, a little bit more next year to get it going. Still the same tarmac surface? Yes, yep. It's still in, it's in pretty good shape. Uh, no lights on it. Uh, uh,
Catherine Snell. Well, Catherine Snell took, took me to <clears throat> Bill and I talked to her last winter. They had a get together for the Northeast Bike Club. And Bill and I had heard a uh, little, little scuttlebutt that uh, Catherine was going to try to get uh, something going and deal with McKittrick, who owned the property. It was son of a gun to deal with. Wouldn't sign a contract. So Bill and I got her aside and we said, listen, Catherine. Whatever you've got in mind, go full bore. And if you think you're all alone, I said, I know 15 people that have got your back. You get it going, and we'll help you out any way we can. And we did. So. Actually, glad to hear that. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of help going on there. Um, in, in, it was also asked about uh, you know, an indoor track. I think. And uh, you know, Red Cross and a few people have been trying to build that up and, and, and get something going there. They've, they've been meeting and organizing and trying to get something going. Uh, I haven't been successful yet, but they, they haven't given up on that. Uh, and so we'll see what happens, and hopefully we can get some more people involved in that. Right. Any final questions? Yes. Tell me. Yes, young lady. Do you still cycle and speed skate today? I, I don't speed skate competitively. I do it for my own enjoyment. Sure. And, you know, I, every winter it's, it's an automatic. My body goes in to shovel at a 400 meter track so we can get a place to skate. Um, I still enjoy the skating. The cycling, Bill McCarthy, uh, I got him into the sport when he was 14 years old. When I, he, I moved across the street from he and his family, and to this day we still ride together. So, and he, when he was a junior, we were traveling everywhere, and he was a good junior competitor, and then when he moved into the senior ranks, just as good. So, John. Yes, so you mentioned Eugene Gaston. Now, I know his name as his being a, um, an orthopedic surgeon in Framingham and also the inventor of the eyeglass-mounted rearview mirror. He took a medical mirror and attached it to his glasses. Let me tell you a quick story about I'm sure Doc you have Gaston. A story about him. <laughs> Doc Gaston, when you went into his cellar, it's a machine shop. We, we had a couple of meetings over there. So Gaston and Doc Galen, who was a dentist, Galen is out riding with, with, uh, with uh, Galen, and Galen said, you know, uh, you know, you keep asking me for one of those mirrors. What do you want it for? Why have you got, he says, I got one in my car. So after the ride, he grabbed that your little little mirror that the dentist would use to get your your back molars. And so the next thing we knew, we had another meeting at, at Gaston's house, and he showed me what he rigged up for his eyeglasses with the mirror. And he did that down in his cellar. One other real quick story. We were General Motors. I'm, I'm a pipe fitter. That's, uh, that's how I... That was my vocation. And we were doing a shutdown at General Motors one summer. And there were four of us. You drive one week, you drive the next week, you drive the next. And we all met at the same place and everyone took their turn driving for a week. We kept passing this gentleman on the bike. I says, ah, he's a good friend of mine. He's, just, he's, a, he's a brain surgeon. And everybody, again, stories. They didn't know whether I was telling them why or what the hell was going on. So, my turn to drive. We go by Galen, or uh, Doc Gaston. I pull over to the side of the road. The guy says, what the hell are you doing, Ringer? we got to get to work. No, we don't. we got to meet Doc Gaston. Who's he? I says, he's the brain surgeon, the friend of mine. Then they're looking at me. They figure I've just lost the screw. So Gaston comes up. He stops, get off his bike. And I said, Dad, I want to introduce you to some friends of mine. So shook their hands and whatever. And I said, Doc, I says, I got one question. What time is the operation this morning? He said, 9.15. I says, is it serious? Oh, yeah. He says, uh, I've got to, got to go in, and we don't know if we can get at it or not. So he's telling us about this operation he's going to do. 
We get back into the car and they said, we thought you were full of baloney. I says, you don't know the people I know. Like I know Larry. <laughs> well, I'll and, tell you. <laughs> so, as I, as I mentioned, that what Doc Gaston would do when he had a real tough operation, he'd go out early in the morning, go for a bike ride, and then, he, he and I talked about this on it, he said, then my mind was clear, and I could go in and perform the operation, I was relaxed. The only thing that got him when he started bicycle riding, he said he had a person open, and he's trying to tie the stitches, and he says, Dick, you got weird, weird positions you, that you've got to hold the thread and tie the stitches and hope nothing had worked. And he said, then I realized what it was. The ulnar nerve and from the vibration on the handlebars. So we were talking to him about it, and so we really padded up his bars so his nerves wouldn't go dead on him. That was the only hang up. Well, just to bring a, a little another connection here, um, a couple of years ago, I went out to Ralph Galen's back shed just after he died. His daughter called me up and said, uh, there's a tremendous amount of bicycling stuff out in uh, my father's uh, back shed, and I'm going to throw it all away unless you come and get it. Oh, help. And uh, so I went up there, filled my car up, and in the back shed, or a couple of these uh, devices, these mirrors that, uh, and I think, uh, and I think if I remember correctly, he was trying to market them. I think he really was. Yeah. So he took Gaston's invention and put it on the market. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, all of his papers, by the way, are down at the uh, UMass Boston Bicycle History Archive. All of Ralph Galen's materials and. It's One of these days, all of Dick Ring's materials. Oh, uh, yeah, to there get you go. <laughs> Tom, a related question. Uh, you said that Gaston was a brain surgeon. No, no, I, it, he was a so, dentist. No, oh, oh Gaston, 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 yes. So he was, he was a, a neurological surgeon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I thought he was an orthopedic surgeon, but this is interesting because he was almost, he was at one of the first people to start wearing a hard shell helmet. Before they were available commercially, he was wearing hockey helmets when he was riding his bike. As the story goes, as I recall it, from the uh, 1970s and before. Let me tell you a quick story about helmets. You've got a story, good. Let me tell you. <laughs> Went to Fitchburg, and a friend of mine from down the Washington area came up to me and he says, Dick, he says, look at this new helmet. He said, I finally swapped mine in. And he had a Broncoli helmet. This, what, 1975? So, he gets on the starting line, and the field of riders, it was a star-studded field, and it broke. Eleven riders, the ten places up for grabs, eleven riders, and the field chasing them down three laps to go. All day long, there was a gentleman, I'm on the podium announcing the bike race. And there was a police officer over on the side that was doing nothing to control this guy from walking back and forth across the street in front of the field. And I talked to, you know, a promoter and a few more, and finally I said, hey, Something's got to be done. There's going to be havoc to play. They ended up with the 11 riders coming up into the line, bell lap, and they're sprinting for all they're worth. Now there's a very small window between the field chasing, the big field chasing the 11 riders. And this gentleman walked right through the middle he didn't get halfway in that road. This friend of mine that showed me his helmet whacked him. Before he hit, this guy hit the ground, he got hit three more times. My buddy went into a parking meter. If he didn't have that helmet on, he would have been dead also. That gentleman ended up 
dying on the road right in front of us. A young mayor, brand new mayor in Fitchburg was standing right beside me when that happened. He couldn't believe it. I said, all day, I've been telling these people to control him. Now he's dead. Funny you should ask. Helmets, as I, as I mentioned, this friend of mine to this day thinks about him going in head first into a parking meter. He said, I would have been dead in the doornail. Well, thanks for, thanks for ending on that note of bicycle safety. <laughs> thank you, Dick. You've done wonderful. Hey, thank you very much, folks. Please, if, if you're interested in, in track racing, we have a terrific system going all summer long. <clears throat> we have training, <coughs> excuse me, training nights, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. Omniums on Sundays. There's all kinds of activity. And Bill, you were saying it's on... A oh, it's either Northeast uh, Velodrome or New England Velodrome, something like that. It'll be able to get something to that effect. Uh, I think next year it'll start to really pick up again. Thank so, you folks very much. There's books upstairs, all the graphics. Thank Thank you take with you for Christmas. Uh, whatever gift you want to give us. Thank you. 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 Thanks, folks. Have a wonderful day. Take a standing O.